Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church Podcast, where we at Calvary Baptist exist to discern the glory of God through His Word, to delight in God's glory with one another, and to display God's glory through everyday living. Stay tuned for the sermon, and for more information, visit us at www.calvarybaptistroy.com. I want to invite you to open with me to John chapter 10, and we're continuing our series in the gospel according to John. John 10 is where we find our text today. John chapter 10. This morning, our text is the first 21 verses, and... um. Uh, Last week, we had a very, very, very long text that was, the text was 41 verses last week, and I only read part of it and then let you sit down, and then we continue to read. And I love you. We're going to do that again, okay? So what we're going to do is I want to ask you all to stand with me, and we will read verses 1 through 11, and then I'll pray you can be seated, and we'll continue to, to read Um, But our text is the first 21 verses, and this morning's message is entitled, The Good Shepherd. So, um, in John chapter 10, verse number 1, the scripture reads, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep openeth. Hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. And when he, putting forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spoke unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace and love, and I pray that you'd help me to communicate your word passionately and accurately. I pray that you would speak to the hearts of your people as we As we look into your word, may we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, would you open our eyes to see? Would you open our ears to hear the voice of God through the words of of the scripture? God, I pray that you would do what what only you can, transforming the hearers from the inside out. I pray that you'd give me grace to do the best that I can in communicating these truths. Um, Lord, I pray that you'd help us all to take what we hear and to, to, to assimilate what we learn into our lives, that we, would, that we would leave this place doers of your word and not hearers only. Deliver us, save us from being um, knowingly hypocritical. Help us to be soft-hearted Christians that are not sinless, but we are repentant sinners. Help us to be soft-hearted Christians that seek to live for you in our lives. Help us to be soft-hearted Christians that are loving one another, and we're seeking unity, uh, not division. We're seeking to spread the gospel and not be in fear of everyone around us. Help us to be bold, soft-hearted Christians, repentant, and following you. And I pray that through this text that reveals to us Um, the identity that you are our good shepherd. I pray that you'd help us to leave this place feeling that truth. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for standing. Please be seated. 
So Jesus tells us he is the good shepherd in verse number 11, and he continues by saying, but he that is a hireling and not the shepherd whose own sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and cares not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, Jesus says, and know my sheep, and I am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Other and other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No man takes, takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. There was a division, therefore, again among the Jews for these sayings. And many of them said, he has a devil and is mad. Why hear you him? Others said, these are not the words of him that hath a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? This morning, church, I want us to pay close attention that Jesus is the greatest teacher to ever live. And he often teaches with memorable stories. And this is, of course, one of those memorable stories. Now, as he's talking through the, the first story, um, the, the actual parable, as it were, really is contained in the first five verses. And then from verse 7 all the way to 18, Jesus is really explaining um, the parable or the, um, the metaphor that he gives in the first five verses. So the story in the first five verses, if I can make some comments to hopefully help us to understand maybe a little bit better this, this parable, because we live in a context that's very different from Jesus' context. Um, I'm not sure if I know any shepherds. Are there any shepherds in the room? No? Do you know any shepherds? I don't personally know any shepherds. And for a little while, um, there were some sheep that actually were um, grazing in a field right across the street from my house. This was years ago, and London might remember this, but uh, we're driving by, and um, I roll down my window, and I start to you know, make the sounds like a sheep to be funny. And they, and the sheep, they start making the sounds too. They start, they start kind of mimicking. Well, there's this one sheep that did not sound like all the other sheep. And we called him the devil sheep <laughs> because he had the scariest bleeding you've ever heard in your life. It haunts me in my, in my dreams to this day. But um, I don't know any shepherds. You probably don't know any shepherds. We're not really familiar with what shepherding looks like. And modern day shepherds normally don't shepherd in exactly the same ways that these ancient Jewish shepherds did their work. So let me explain to you, um, if you're unfamiliar, one of the ways that the shepherds of ancient Israel would shepherd in ways that's different from us today. One of them is really highlighted, or it's, it's actually assumed, I should say, in Jesus' story, as Jesus says, verily, verily, or amen, amen, I say unto you, truly, truly, I say unto you, he that enters not by the door into the sheepfold that climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. So the sheepfold that is mentioned here in this verse, this has, um, this is referring to what I might try to call a community pen. So in ancient Israel, you have shepherds, you have multiple shepherds, they all have their own flocks. And, and what these shepherds would sometimes do if they were not sleeping with their flocks, if they were going to come home and they were going to um, go back to their beds, they would lead their flocks back to what I'm calling a community pen. Um, and it would, it would have three walls, usually made of stone, high enough to keep predators out and, of course, to keep the sheep in for their own safety. And so in, in, uh, in the entryway of this of this 
sheepfold or this community pen would have been oftentimes a gatekeeper. He would have been a man that was hired um, by, the, by the shepherd to be able to stay in that doorway all night long. So that shepherd is able to go back um, and he's able to get some rest. But the reason why I call this a community pen is because oftentimes this was available to multiple shepherds having different sheepfolds. So you could have two shepherds with two different flocks of sheep, or three for that matter, and they might bring their, their sheep all together to spend the night under the watchful eye of that hired hand who is the gatekeeper. And so you have these two flocks inside a community pen made up of three walls that are um, high enough to keep predators out and high enough to keep the sheep safe within. And then you have the gatekeeper that he kind of uh, stands in the doorway and he protects the sheep and he's there to make sure that they don't wander off. And this is what Jesus is talking about when he says, truly, truly, I say unto you, he that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up another way, the same as a thief and a robber. So the story that Jesus is, begins telling, um, there's this community pen, as it were, and, and thieves and robbers don't come through the front door. They don't come through the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper is not going to allow thieves and robbers to, to just walk right in and steal the sheep. So what a thief and a robber would do, they might climb that wall and try to get in and take the sheep that way. But Jesus says that... Um, um, he that enters in by the door is, is the shepherd of the sheep. And, he, and to him, the porter or the gatekeeper opens. And the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. When he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them. And the sheep know him and they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow. So in Jesus' story, right, um, the shepherd brings, and this was common practice in the ancient ancient Jewish world. Let's just for sake of conversation, two shepherds, they bring their sheep, they bring their flock into this community pen. Their gatekeeper is there all night. He makes sure that the, that the sheep are safe, well taken care of, and they are. The next morning, the shepherds both arrive roughly at the same time. And you have the gatekeeper, and the gatekeeper will not allow anybody into um, this this community pen. You have to be one of these shepherds. And so the shepherds, they come roughly about the same time. And here it is that one shepherd, he calls his sheep and he calls his sheep by name. And they know him. They know their shepherd's voice. And that's why they follow him because they know their shepherd and their shepherd knows them. And there's no confusion. There's no losing of sheep. Sheep are, they, they're, the sheep and the shepherd are so, um, they know each other so well that all the shepherd must do, he doesn't have to brand his sheep. He just simply calls them and they come. Because the other shepherd that also has a flock of sheep in that community pen, they will not follow his voice if they don't belong to him because he is a stranger to them, and the sheep feel re they feel rested. They feel safe. They feel secure when they hear their master's voice. But when they hear a stranger's voice, they will not follow him. They will run. They stay away from the stranger, but they love, they know their shepherd, and they follow him. And so all the shepherd must do is simply to call their name, they come. And the gatekeeper, once the shepherd calls his sheep and the second shepherd calls his sheep, the gatekeeper's job is done and he can go about his business. And this is the way of shepherding in first century Judaism, at least this is the example um, really that Jesus is giving. Now that example often um, falls upon deaf ears for us because we're not as familiar with these practices. But knowing the practices 
I think, very, very helpful for Jesus' story. And it's a beautiful story, memorable story, and there's so much meaning here. There's far more, there's far more than I have time to really unfold for you. Um, and Jesus is going to um, beautifully explain this, and, and there's so much contained. But this morning, we're really trying to focus our attention this morning on the Good Shepherd. And so these stories that Jesus tells, although they are brilliantly crafted, they are perfectly delivered. They do not always land. And it's not Jesus' fault. It's the hearers. Let's look at this, because when Jesus gives this parable, verse number six, this parable spake Jesus unto them, the greatest teacher to ever live, the, the most interesting storyteller to ever live. But they understood not what things were which he spoke unto them. They did not understand. They didn't get it. And... They understood their own context. They understood how shepherding worked in their own context, and they didn't understand it. And so it makes perfect sense that when we don't understand that first century Jewish context, that we have a difficult time to understand it. But the problem isn't in understanding the Scripture. The problem is never really um, uh, a lack of, of knowledge or of intellect. It's a spiritual problem. You see, Jesus is the greatest storyteller to ever do it. And sometimes people don't understand what he's saying. And it's not because they're not intelligent. They are intelligent. It's not because Jesus isn't a great teacher, because he's the best. But the reason is a spiritual problem. There is something within the heart uh, of the hearer that is hindering their understanding. You see, Jesus sometimes speaks about it this way. He, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. Because Jesus could speak to the same crowd, and some in the crowd hear him and understand him, and others in the crowd hear him but do not understand him. And so the ones that hear and understand, they have ears to hear. Those that hear him but don't understand, they do not have ears to hear. And the problem is a spiritual one. There is... There is there is an obstacle here. And so Jesus, he, um, he tells us, he says, I am the door in verse number seven. Now, remember, in Jesus' parable, you have the gatekeeper. Now, um, I want to remind you that parables and these metaphors that Jesus uses, these stories, we should not simply assume that every detail in the story has a one-for-one significance in application, okay? Let me give you, um, let me show this to you. In the one story, you see a shepherd and you see a gatekeeper, right? These are two different people. But when Jesus explains this story, he tells us that he is the door. He's that gatekeeper. And he also says, I'm also the good shepherd. So Jesus takes up two roles in the one story, Okay, so Jesus says, I am the door. I am the gatekeeper, right? He's the one that stands between harm and his sheep. He's the one that protects. He's the one that gives entrance. He's the one that lets them come in and out. He's the door. And he's also the good shepherd. He's also the one that knows his sheep by name and he calls them by name and they hear the master's voice and they follow their master. They follow their good shepherd. And because he's a good shepherd, he is very different from a bad shepherd. Now, who are these bad shepherds? You see, John chapter 10 begins here, verily, verily, saying to you, would you glance down in your Bibles and look at that? I want to remind you that chapter divisions are not original to the text. Chapter divisions are helpful. It's great that, that I can say to you this morning, let's open our Bibles to John chapter 10. And we all know, we all can find that. We all know where that is. It's like an address. It's excellent. It's beautiful. And they're very, very helpful. But chapter divisions are not something that you, um, that you should put your trust into. The reason I'm telling you this is um, 
there's a chapter division in the middle of the same story. John chapter 9 and John chapter 10 are connected. Look at the end of the text that we read this morning, verse 21. Others said, these are not the words of him that has a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? Why are they talking about Jesus opening the eyes of the blind and therefore proving that he does not have a devil because some think he has a devil. Some think he's demon-possessed. But others are saying he doesn't have a devil. He opened, he opened a man's eyes who was born blind and he now sees. There's no way he can be possessed of a devil. How did that enter into this conversation? Because that is what happened in John chapter 9 and John chapter 10 and John chapter 9 are one. And so the only reason why I'm telling you this is I want us to understand the context because Jesus is the good shepherd and that means there are bad shepherds. Who's the bad shepherd? Well, in Jesus's immediate context, he is referring to the religious leaders of his day. Last week, we talked about those, those who have bad religion <laughs> and the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sanhedrin. Oh, they are, they are the ones that are propagating bad religion. They are the source of this bad religion. And here it is that Jesus is telling this story. He's the good shepherd, and, and the religious leaders of his day, they are the bad shepherd. And in fact, if um, these first century Jews could, would remember the Old Testament, specifically Ezekiel chapter 34, and we don't have time to get into Ezekiel 34, but mark it down, go home and read Ezekiel 34 later, and I want you to recognize the, uh, the, the way that Jesus really uses Old Testament scripture in his stories, and he really emphasizes the fact that these are, uh, these Religious leaders are shepherds, they're just terrible shepherds. And he goes on, as he explains the parable, to even call them thieves and robbers and strangers. And then all of a sudden in the parable, right, there is a wolf introduced. And we'll get to that in just a moment. So Jesus is the good shepherd, um, and there are bad shepherds. These bad shepherds are also thieves. So in Ezekiel 34, as you read it, when you go home, right? In Ezekiel 34, God is chastising the religious leaders of, of Ezekiel's day because they are shepherds who are fleecing the flock. They are shepherds that don't care for the sheep. They just care for what the sheep can give to them. They care about the sheep only as far as the sheep help them. The sh they, they, they use the sheep. They don't care for the sheep. They, they, the sheep are things to them. There's no real relationship. They are, they are terrible shepherds. They are propagators of bad religion. They are like thieves and robbers. And Jesus enters into this scene and he tells these people, he says, don't listen to them. I am the good shepherd. And he goes on in the story to identify a wolf. Now, this is interesting because in the original telling of the story, um, there is no wolf in the story. But Jesus is now explaining that first parable in the first five verses. And he, he enters, he, he brings a wolf into the story. And he talks about the hireling. So the hireling. So now all of a sudden, as Jesus explains this story from a different angle, he's no longer the door. Are you with me? He's no, who's the door now? Who's the gatekeeper now? In this angle that Jesus is now using this story to teach, now it's those bad shepherds. It's the hireling. It's, it's the hired hand that's, that's, that's laying in the, in the doorway of that, of that community pen. What happens when a hired hand is threatened by a large, strong, intimidating, hungry wolf? Well, the way that Jesus tells the story is the wolf comes and the hired hand 
those bad shepherds, those religious leaders that do not care about people. They care what the people can give to them. They care what the people will do for them. It's not about these people's spiritual health and growth and development. It's not about these people knowing God and walking with God. It's about these people honoring them. It's about these people serving them. It's about these people giving to them. It's about these people honoring and, and providing for them. They don't care about these people. They are terrible shepherds. They are hired hands. They are, they are false prophets. They are, they are the source of bad religion. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. They are not. They are hired hands. And when the wolf comes, what does the hired hand do? When that big, terrifying, dark wolf gets ready because he's hungry, the hired hand runs. The hired hand saves himself. The hired hand will not risk his life for the sheep that he does not care for. So, if these religious leaders are the hired hand, and Jesus is the good shepherd, who's the wolf? Sin, Satan, death. When the wolf comes, church, when the temptation of sin is coming for you, when, when heartache and pain because of some tragedy is coming for you, the bad shepherd leaves. When you're broken and you're hurting and you're in danger and you need help, the bad shepherd leaves you. The bad shepherd isn't interested in your problems. The bad shepherd's not interested in, in helping you to navigate, to help you to escape the wolf. The bad shepherd is not willing to fight for you and with you and alongside you. The bad shepherd leaves because the bad shepherd never cared, but that's not who Jesus is. Jesus is the good shepherd, and the good shepherd he lays his life down for the sheep. If the wolf is sin, Satan, and death, Jesus lays down his life for his sheep. And that's, what G, that's, that's really the emphasis that we have in Jesus' words here in verses 11 and 12. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd who's owned the sheep or not, he sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and he flees. The wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and he cares not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I am known of mine. Jesus lays his life down for you. This is the gospel. Listen to me. This is the gospel. Um, this relationship between the shepherd and his sheep is, is an expression of Trinitarian love. Look at verse 14. I am the good shepherd, and, and I know my sheep, and I am known of mine as or like in a way similar to. I love my sheep. I know my sheep. My sheep know, know me in a way similar to the way that the Father knows me. And I know the Father. And I lay my, down, my life down for the sheep. Why does Jesus lay his life down for the sheep? Because he and the Father have this, have this um, relationship. The Father sends the Son to die for a people who he has loved. Jesus enters into human history obeying the Father and willingly lives sinless, learning obedience to the Father. The eternal Son, who is very God, learns to obey the Father in place of these, of these sinners. You see, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient. Why? In order to be obedient for us. This morning in the New Testament reading, we heard Maverick read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where it said, in Adam all die, in Christ will all be made alive. 
You see, every single person is born into this world in Adam. We are born as natural pro, uh, progeny, natural children of the one and first man, Adam. Jesus enters into human history. He enters the scene, and the only way, right, so in Adam, all die. We all die because we are sinners. We are sinners because of Adam. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and death passed upon all men, because all have sinned. Because of Adam, we are all natural-born sinners. But Jesus, Jesus is the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. He is the good shepherd that calls his sheep by name, and they follow him. He is the son that's sent by the Father to enter into human history, to, to obey God's law. In the Old Testament text you, you heard this morning in Hosea, you heard, you heard Eric read, and they broke the covenant like Adam. Adam broke covenant with God when he sinned against God. Adam was in relationship with God. He was given laws of all the trees of the garden. You can freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you may not eat of it because in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And when Adam broke God's law, he broke that covenant. And now all of us, because we are natural descendants of Adam, we were, uh, we were part of that covenant between God and humanity. And Adam represented all of us. And because Adam's a sinner, we are natural born sinners. And we are sinners, not only by our nature, but also by our free choice. And like Adam, we broke the covenant with God. When God gave us the law written upon our hearts, you shall not lie, you shall not steal, you shall not, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery. All of these kinds of laws that we know, we know the difference between right and wrong. God has written this moral code upon your heart. But we have broken it all on our own because we want to break it and because we're naturally inclined to break it because we are sinners. We are sinners because of Adam. Adam broke the covenant, and in Adam all die. Church, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the father sends the son into the world, and the son learns to obey. He obeys the father. The reason he learns to obey is because he is eternal God, and God doesn't obey. But Christ, the God-man, does. And he obeys the Father. And he does the very will of God. Everything the Father tells him to do, he does. Everything the Father tells him to say, he says. Everywhere the Father tells him to go, he goes. And Jesus is sent by the Father into the world to live that sinless life that we ought to live. If you're going to gain entrance into eternal life, like, like, the, like the rich young ruler, he says, good master, what good thing can I do to inherit eternal life? I want to gain it. I want to know it. Give, give, me, give me the formula. What do I do so that I can enter into heaven? And Jesus tells him to obey God's law. Why does Jesus tell him to obey God's law in order to gain heaven? Because before a sinner can believe the gospel, they must first understand that they are sinners. And this is what the rich young ruler's problem was. He answers Jesus when Jesus says, if you want to earn and gain heaven for yourself, the way, the way to earn heaven is through obeying the law. And the rich young ruler says, all these have I kept from my youth up. In church, I know it's in the Bible that he said, all these have I kept from my youth up. But that was a lie. The Bible records correctly when people lie. And that rich young ruler lied. He did not keep the law. He was not sinlessly perfect. 
and he was not nearly as good as he thought he was. And isn't that the predicament that we all tend to find ourselves in? Don't we all tend to see ourselves as being more moral than we really are? As being better than we really are? We tend that way at least. Now, Jesus tells him, if you're going to earn eternal life, you must obey the law. Why did he say that? Because that is theoretically true. And here's the problem. That no natural born sinner is able to obey the law. And that's why no natural born sinner is able to inherit eternal life through their own deeds, through their own actions. But that's why the good shepherd came. The Father sends the Son into human history to live that life that we ought to live but cannot live. He lives it in our place. And He, because He is in covenant, the Son, in covenant with the Father for a people, He calls these people unto Himself. And these people He lives for. He dies for. He loves them. He leads them. He guides them. He protects them. He saves them. And Jesus lives sinlessly for sinners who cannot merit salvation. But Jesus does merit salvation for them. And then because these sinners are in fact guilty, and God being a holy, righteous, just judge cannot simply sweep your sins under the rug. God must punish righteously. And that's why Jesus went to the cross. And that's why Jesus laid his life down for his sheep. Because someone must die for breaking God's law. And Jesus died because we broke God's law. God sent his son in the world to live for us and to die for us. And Jesus laid down his life for his sheep. But not only did Jesus lay down his life for his sheep. Jesus says, and the Father knows me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore does my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man takes it from me but I lay it down on myself and I have power to take it again and I have, I, I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. You see, this commandment, this is talking about this covenant relationship that, that is between the Father and the Son. This is the commandment that the Father has given to me. This is the responsibility. This is the job. This is the duty. This is the obligation. This is why I've entered into human history. Jesus didn't come simply to be a good example, and he's the best. But Jesus came to be a sacrifice for us, to live sinlessly for us, to die for us. But my friends, Jesus came also to live again for us. You see, you and I, one day, oh, Jesus died for our sins. And when you believe in Jesus, you have what the Bible calls eternal life. But it is appointed on a man once to die. And you see, every single person in this room, if Jesus does not come back before, he might come back today. Don't you forget it. But if Jesus doesn't come back in our lifetime, every single person in this room will close your eyes in death. You will, like Jesus, as a human person, give up the ghost. You will bow your head in death. And then, where will you be? It is appointed on a man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Jesus entered into human history to live sinlessly for you, to die as your replacement so that you don't have to die, but you will close your eyes in death. But this is part of the glorious 
good news of the gospel, the promise of Christ, that when you believe in Jesus, not only do you have new spiritual life, but you will have new physical life. We confessed this morning that I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, in his only son, our Lord Jesus Christ, that he was crucified, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. At the end of it, we confess that we believe in the resurrection of the dead. We believe that one day that all who are dead, who have believed in Christ, will all be raised to life like Jesus was raised to life, and we will walk and talk and love and celebrate and sing and dance and work, and, and we will be one family under God from every nation, every tongue, every tribe, we will sing to the glory of the risen Lamb of God. That's not a hope. That's a reality. Do you believe it? If you say, I do believe it, that's because you're one of his sheep. Because the shepherd speaks and his sheep hear and the sheep follow. If you're here and you say, I don't yet believe, I hope that you would stay. I hope that you might read. I hope that you might investigate these things. I hope that you might even, even try to pray or uh, involve yourself. Because just because you can't hear the shepherd today doesn't mean you won't hear him tomorrow. People are praying for you. People love you. There, if you don't hear the shepherd's voice today, don't just leave. You see, Jesus' words here are so meaningful, so powerful. And when Jesus rose from the dead, it proved everything that he said was true. God's love for his people, both Jews and Gentiles. That's why Jesus says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them and they will all be of one fold, one flock, under one shepherd. Jews and Gentiles, the entire world. That's what Jesus has in view, the entire world. You see, God's love for his people is in view here. And this mystery of being his, because he calls his own and his own follow him. Jesus' protection and provision through the gospel is also in view. Very, very quickly. Let me show you um, four life-changing truths about Jesus as the good shepherd. And it will be quickly. Number one, the good shepherd speaks to us with love. Remember, he, he calls you by name. He speaks to us with love, church. We are sheep. And if you're unfamiliar, like I often am, a sheep is helpless. It's also harmless for the most part. But a sheep is helpless, and we are sheep. We are spiritually helpless. We are naturally prone to wander, and we are easy prey for Satan, for sin, for the culture that would teach us to follow it rather than Christ. We're easy prey. Jesus is the good shepherd. And he does not use his sheep for his gain. In fact, there is nothing that Jesus gains through us. I give nothing to Jesus that, the, that he didn't already have. What can I give? What can I offer him? I can offer nothing. I can offer him my life. He already, he, he already owns my life. I can offer him my obedience. But my obedience isn't always pure, is it? Oftentimes, don't we find, if we really take introspection, don't we find that oftentimes we obey partly for the right reason, partly for the wrong reason? There is nothing I can offer to him that is of any real value to him. I will pray to him. What does he receive from my prayers? He is God. He is eternal. He is, I say, of himself. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. What can he get from me? Nothing, church. But do you know why he wants you? Because he loves you. 
And he loves you in a way that is hard for us to understand because we tend to love things and people who serve some kind of purpose for us. They mean something to us. We are, we are unsatisfied without them. We cannot survive without them, right? We need people. This is human. This is right. There's nothing wrong with that. I need my wife. My wife needs me. I need my children. My children need me. This is the way of the world, and it is good, but this is what's so different from God. This is why he is holy. The word holy means other than. God loves you better than you've ever loved anyone in your world, in, in the world. God loves you more than anybody else has ever loved you, but he loves you not because you can offer anything to him, because you in fact cannot. He loves you because he is good, not because you're good. God's love for you is not based upon how moral you were this morning. His love is based upon himself. And it's that kind of love that elicits a response of faith and trust more love, which is why John, the apostle, the same one that wrote this book in 1 John tells us that we do in fact love him. Well, we love him because he first loved us. Our love is a response to his love. His love is unfathomable. And that's why we love him. He's the good shepherd. Jesus, he calls us by name, and Jesus' call is heard by all, but not all have ears to hear. Not all respond, and this is the mystery. Jesus calls. He calls in the gospel. I just talked you through the gospel, the good news of Christ. And if you've not yet heard the voice of the shepherd in the gospel, stay and hear it again. Because just like me, so many others heard Jesus' call dozens and hundreds of times until one day, finally, they heard his voice. They followed. And their lives have never been the same since. You see, the good shepherd, he speaks to us with love. The good shepherd leads us with his grace. Jesus doesn't drive us from behind. He, he leads us from the front. Modern day shepherds, as far as I know, many of them use sheepdogs. What do sheepdogs do? They run alongside the sheep. And what do they do? They bark, they nip, they keep them, they herd them, right? It, I, I have no doubt it's effective. I have no doubt these dogs are, care for these sheep, undoubtedly, right? They have their use, but I just want to point something out to you. That's not how ancient um, Jewish um, shepherds did this. And this is not how Jesus does it. Jesus is not walking alongside his church with a big stick trying to whack everybody that starts to get out of line. What he is doing is he's standing in the front. And do you know what's so valuable about that? Because if there's danger in the front, he's there to meet it. If there's a cliff in the front, he's there to give you a detour. If there is a ledge, if there is something wrong, he's there to lead you away. And he loves you and he's calling you by name and he is looking for you. And in some rare instance that we being prone to wander, Lord, we feel it, prone to leave the God we love. What does Jesus do as the good shepherd? But that he leads the 99 to go and find the one that is lost, puts that sheep on his back, carries that sheep to the safety of the sheepfold, and rejoices over the one that wandered but now has returned. He does not find the wandering sheep to beat him. He finds the wandering sheep to protect and love them. Jesus leads from the front, grace. The good shepherd protects us and provides for us. It's through him that we come in and out. We find pasture. At different times in our lives, Jesus will be with us in every instance. If you look at the, at the Psalm 23, 
It's, it's a psalm about God being the good shepherd. And what does the good shepherd do for us? He makes me lie down in green pastures by the streams of water. But do you know what else he does? Christian, he will lead you through the valley of the shadow of death. He will lead you to your best days. And he's leading you. But he's also going to lead you through your worst days. But the comfort is, he didn't leave you. Even when you lost him in your view, he is with you. He is the good shepherd. The good shepherd, lastly, the good shepherd saves our lives with sacrifice. As helpless sheep, the wolf will come. But the gospel is in Jesus' willing life, death, and resurrection. And his sheep are believers who are followers. We are believers who are followers followers. We follow him. A few chapters ago, we talked about perseverance. If you are Jesus's sheep, you hear his voice and you follow. It doesn't mean sinless perfection, but it does mean repentance. And it does mean following. It does mean obedience to the very best that you can give today. And Jesus, by his grace, will lead you into greater obedience. He will lead you into greater faithfulness. Jesus will protect and provide for you. Just don't leave him. If Calvary Baptist Church is a sheep pen, are you one of Jesus' sheep? Jesus is the good shepherd. Let's pray. Hear us, Lord. The great shepherd of our souls. We do see ourselves and feel ourselves to be your sheep. We have all been gathered by your loving voice to you. We have been purchased at the highest price. Although we were dirty, sickly, stubborn, and broken, you have cleansed us, healed us, and tamed our wild hearts, and made us whole. For this grace, we thank you and we worship you. As you lead us through this dark valley, on our journey to the everlasting green pastures of the new heaven and earth, may your voice be clear in your word to our hearts. We need your staff to chasten us when we begin to wander, and we ask for your presence to be palpable so that we may be bold in our lives in the face of all difficulties. For some here today, they feel themselves lost from you. God, make your love known to them as you have to me. Find in them their lost condition and carry them into the sheepfold for their good and for your glory so that we may all rejoice together with you. This sermon was brought to you by Calvary Baptist Church of Roy in Washington. For more information on how you can join us for our weekly worship service, please go to www.